Okay, we are here at the Heinz Convention Center in Back Bay at the Boston International Antiquarian Book Fair 2019. And we've got a very special guest <laughs> sitting in front of the camera this time, <laughs> Michael Ginsberg. Thank you. You may recognize the voice. Yeah, the voice is the same. The voice is the same. <laughs> but now we get the full story, the full story. It's such a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to have you interview me. <laughs> Thank you, the honor's mine. Uh, it's been a long time that you've been in this book business, and I'd like to dial it all the way back. Sure. Tell me about the beginning, the beginning of M. Ginsberg. Uh, well, I started off by being a uh, juvenile delinquent. And uh, my cousin Cynthia, when I was about 16 years old, my cousin Cynthia worked for a company called J.S. Canner and Company. They dealt in periodicals and journals, and uh, they had a small uh, Americana department and a small scholarly book department. Um, and so she said to me, you're going the wrong way. I'm going to get you a job at where I work, and uh, maybe it'll help you. So she got me a job, and I started there. About a week after I was there, um, the owner came up to me and said, look, I, I've just made a purchase, and I've got a couple of boxes in the car. Would you bring them in and put them up on the shelves? So I brought them in, and I put them up on the shelves, and I started, you know, looking at them. They were kind of interesting and stuff, and I was looking at them for about 10 or 15 minutes, and I didn't know that he had come back, and he said, he said to me, um, do you know anything about books? I said I read a lot of cowboy and Indian stuff, you know, when I, when I was in my teens. He said, there are five books here that are worth over $100. Um, can you pick them out? I'll be back in 20 minutes. Well, 20 minutes he came back. I had all five picked out. Oh, my gosh. It's, you know, it's, uh, Leona Rostenberg used to tell me that there's a thing in Germany called Fingergespressen. You put your hand on the book, and it tells you how much its value is. I don't really go by that, but that's, that's what she, she intimated. And I, I sort of thought that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Well, I started working for, for Canners, and, and uh, my boss said to me, well, you know, you're through cleaning toilets and doing errands and stuff. You've got the potential to be a good book man because you have that, that gene that nobody else may have in the area that gives you this opportunity to be involved. Mm -hmm. And so he taught me a lot of stuff. I went to a lot of things on my own. And I worked there from 1957 to 1967. And in 1967, there was a, cr a crucial moment. Mm -hmm. The person who was running the uh, periodicals department wanted more of the budget than I was getting doing the book stuff. And so it came to a point where we had to make a decision. Is J.S. Canner a company going to be a book company or is it going to be a periodical company? And they decided they wanted to be a periodical company. So there I was, standing, you know, like I am from you, mm -hmm. having somebody tell me that, um, you know, we're heading more in the direction of periodicals than we are in books, and uh, we thought you should know that. I said, fine. Ten minutes later, my boss, other boss, the Gene Schwab, who was the partner in the company, uh, came up to me and he said, look, I think you and I could really do a lot business-wise. Let's, you know, I've got the money and, and you seem to have the, uh, the touch. So we worked from 1967 to around 1975, we worked together. One of the problems was that he always would complain that um, I wasn't, you know, making enough money for us. But I would also say to him, well, every three months you go to Taiwan. Yeah. He, uh, he met a woman, a girl, in Taiwan that he kept going back and forth to see. And eventually um, he brought her, he said that her dream was to marry a rich American and live in America. So he made a dr dream come true. And um, of course he enjoyed every moment of it. That's right. He was like in his 50s and she was in her 20s. Okay. Which is, I suppose it's okay. And so he said to me, we can't be doing this. We're, we're sort of like, you, you're rowing this way and I'm rowing that way and we're not going to be able to do this. So I said, okay, um, let's just split up, etc." So the only thing I got from leaving J.S. Canner, Canner Company was uh, a thank you for all you've done, blah, blah, blah. 
So we started a business called Western Hemisphere, Gene Schwab and I. And we had it basically in a, uh, in a small building over a restaurant in the center of Sharon, where I originally was living. And it was a second floor, and we put in some shelves. We had two or three rooms, and uh, we made it you know, look nice, etc. And uh, we didn't do any local business at all because for the most part, pe people didn't know what the hell we were doing anyhow. So we started to branch out into little things. And um, I said to him one day, I said, look, the periodicals market and the book market in Japan is coming, is going to start coming soon. And we need to do something about that. We need to go over and make contacts. So he said, well, that's a good thing for you to do because I've, I have other things to do. So I went to Berlitz for two years, two nights a week, to learn how to read, speak, and understand Japanese. And um, I read a book, two books on how to do business in Japan, et cetera, and I had all these facts and stuff. And I'm flying to Japan, and I'm saying, I'm getting, looking at my notes, and I'm yes. saying to myself, okay, uh, so I get off the plane, and there's a, three or four guys waiting for me, and they have a big sign, Welcome to Japan, Mr. Ginsburg. So I said, oh, this is really nice. This is the boys from Yoshoto. So I go over, and I, in my best Japanese, I, I say, what a pleasure it is to be in your country, and what a, how nice it is to meet you. And they said, no, do not speak Japanese. We want to learn English. Oh, my gosh. So I was not allowed to speak Japanese the entire time I was with those guys. They only wanted me to speak English. And they took me to some uh, pretty Rococo kind of places. Uh, and we had a wonderful time. And every night we would go out uh, drinking and seeing all these wonderful Japanese girls who would, you know, sit with you for eight dollars an hour. Amazing. But you know, nothing, nothing evil. Just they were like taught to be com comforting to the businessman from America. So we had a lot of fun. We did a lot of things. I, I opened up the Japanese market in periodicals for a lot of places. I used to get phone calls from people who were thinking about going to Japan and doing business. Do you have any suggestions on what we should do? And I would frankly tell them exactly what I did. Yeah. And you know, you can do any derivation thereof. But it was a wonderful experience. From 19, oh, early 60s, middle 60s, all the way up until 1990, I was making two or three trips a year to Japan. And I would spend anywhere from a week to two weeks. And I would have with me a, um, a list of all the periodicals we had. I have a list of all the economics and social books that we had, because this is the thing they were doing. And um, I was able to give everybody lists as I did. I found out something very interesting, that uh, Japanese booksellers want to take you out for dinner. Well, when they take you out for dinner, they size you up, get a feeling of whether or not they want to do anything with you. And they usually after the dinner, they will say to you, please be in my office at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. We have much to discuss. Wow. So that, that's how that's, that all started. So then one night, I was out with the boys from Yoshoto and um, the two librarians from uh, Japanese universities. And the boys from Yoshoto decided it was too late for them to be up because they had to be working the next morning. So they left me with these two drunken librarians who don't speak any English at all. All they speak was Japanese. So I tried to get what, what they were looking for, where they were going. I took them outside. I called a cab. And I told the cab driver uh, in Japanese, take them home. And I gave them like 25 or 30 bucks or something. That was the last time I saw them. <laughs> I just assumed they got home. I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. But that was that was really a, a fabulous experience, doing business in, in a different language in a different country, uh, as a as a youngish guy, and mm -hmm. wonderful experiences, and, and met some wonderful people that I still correspond with to this day, 25, 30 years later. Um, but basically, after that. After Western Hemisphere. Yeah. Uh, what but, happened to Western Hemisphere? Uh, it continued on with Schwab and his son, Gene. Okay. Um, and they just wanted to keep on doing it. I didn't. I, I felt like it was time. 
It's 1975. I've been doing this for almost 20 years. It's about time I did it on my own. So I went to the um, Small Business Bureau and I explained to them what I wanted to do and how much money I would I'd like to, to borrow. And um, the guy said to me, you know, it sounds like you're embarking on a capricious adventure. So I said to him, look, this is what I know and this is how I make a living. And I brought with me, you know, the directories and all the stuff that was available. And he said, well, let me look, look at this stuff and I'll get back to you. So the next morning I got a call and said, your, your loan's been approved. So I went from a capricious adventure to a serious person. So I think I borrowed $18,000 and I, I could pay it back, you know, monthly, et cetera. I paid it all back in about three months. Because I, I got a couple of really good buys, and I was able to make a lot of money quick, and my knowledge was was really what it was, you know. What kind of books were those? I I bought um, mostly Americana books, okay. but I never would pass up something that looked good that had nothing to do with Americana. How did you know it after dealing with Japanese material in such a focused way for 20 years? Finger, ah. I took a look at the book. And I said to myself, I think this is a good one. Okay. And I was batting like about 900. Mm -hmm. So for every 90 bo 100 books I bought, 10 of them were losers, but nine of them, 90 of them were okay. And um, so that's really how it began. And then I began to spread out, and I began to travel around the country, uh, California, the Pacific Northwest, the Midwest, uh, Texas, et cetera. And, um, I just kept going, and I just kept finding things, selling things. I visited university libraries, and uh, the big ones in the Big Ten, I went to the ones in the Midwest. How did you know how to knock on their door, what to say, how did you? Uh, well, what I would do is I would set up an appointment, I would you know, send them a, a letter or call them and say, look, I'm going to be in Salt Lake City uh, for two or three days. I would like very much to come up, see your library, talk to you, and see which way you're heading. And um, I really seldom got any kind of a refusal. Uh, in those days, the librarians knew much, as much about books as the booksellers did. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Marcus McCorrisons and the Graffininos and all the other guys who are working these major libraries, they see so much coming across their desk. They see so much in their own files, in their own library, that um, they really know just about as much of their subject as the booksellers know. And I found that was kind of interesting that a collector would know as much about their field as a bookseller knows about their field. Mm -hmm. And so I made great connections with the Bancroft in California, uh, with uh, Washington State the Library and the Historical Society. Salt Lake City, I had the University of Utah, who I still do business with, and uh, you know, Denver Public Library, University of Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. I dealt primarily in the West, so I thought it would be more important to go west of the Mississippi mm -hmm. to try to get things going rather than east. Yeah. And then I met George Miles, who was the director of the Beinecke at Yale. Mm -hmm. uh, he was taking over for Archie Hanna. Now, Archie was a good friend. Um, he always he always had uh, myself and my wife over for dinner when we came to New Haven, or uh, we'd have lunch with him at the St. Patolf Club on mm -hmm. Commonwealth Avenue. And uh, he was a great old dude who was an interpreter of, uh, uh, of Japanese during World War II. He would, inter he would interrogate prisoners. He was a reverend, mm -hmm. he, and he was um, head of the library. I mean, he had a really checkered career, which was wonderful. And um, when he left to retire, uh, I said, gee, I, I don't know who's going to take over, who's going to be as good as this guy. And so they hired this guy, George Miles. I went and met him, and um, I said, geez, George, you know, you remind me of somebody who's been in the trade for a long time. You know an awful lot about what you're doing, which is not what you usually see nowadays. Mm -hmm. I said, well, here's your, here's your quest for you. I want to buy almost everything west of the Mississippi, imprints west of the Mississippi. We're going to specialize at the Beinecke in all phases of Western Americana. And uh, we want to buy uh, every item that's in house that we don't have. So that's a nice project to be working yes, on as is. a sideline. Yes, and um, also I get duplicates from them too. Uh, 
I want to go down to Yale maybe every two months or so. Mm -hmm. Have a little suitcase or a little satchel with some wonderful stuff that I had got. And invariably, I sell it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, and it was great. And uh, I figured this is going to last a long time. Well, I didn't figure it was going to last this long. <laughs> I mean, I thought at some point I would have the intelligence to stop doing what I'm doing and do something that I liked, which was, uh, I don't know, I like doing appraisals and I like doing consulting work. It's just I'm not enough of it to survive. Okay. But uh, selling books opens up a whole area of other activities, yeah. like consulting and, and like appraising mm -hmm. and uh, suggestions. Uh, should I send this to auction? Uh, and I would say, look, if you're going to send this to auction, tops you're going to get about 30, 35% of your retail. If you donate it, you're going to get X amount from your tax basis. But if you want to sell it as a collection, you're going to do far better than trying to sell the pieces of the whole thing. And you're going to find yourself in a much better position. So that's the kind of things I, I would do. And um, I took a lot of stuff on consignment over the years, simply because it's a lot easier to b sell somebody else's book that you have no money in mm -hmm. than it is to go and bang on doors and stuff. So I, I had a customer by the name of Gene Gressley, who was at the University of Wyoming. And um, he was a good guy. And he told me at one point that he's going to donate his collection to his school, which was... Um, someplace in Indiana, it, it, it was, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it was someplace in the, near Wabash, Indiana, and that's where I would stay when I went to visit. And I, I visited them and they said, look, we have Gene Gressley's collection here, and we're a, pharma, a pharmacology college. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a few minutes, we have no, we have no we have reason to, uh, to have Black all this Fox stuff. Theater to so the I said, okay. The first He's question they asked me was, is this worth Alice working? King, American ancestors and I said, yeah. Genealogical yeah. Society it turned out there was about, the first steps in tracing about your $250,000 to $300,000 yeah, worth of books. And my and deal with them was I would get 35% and they would get 65%. So the collection may have been this wide, and as, as the few years started to go by and then after about three or four or five years it, there was a there was a uh, sort of like a basic remnant mm -hmm. all good books but not not saleable right now so we made a deal that I bought the final group which was about a hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff and I bought it for twenty thousand dollars and that was their figure not mine and I said you know I can get more out of this yeah said, yeah, but we would rather have the money and have the books out of here so we can have more stuff for, for um, uh, what do they call them, grants or something. Because the, the world doesn't have enough pharmacists, I guess. Yeah. So I did very well with that collection. And uh, I did very well with other collections that I took on consignment. And I found it was a fun way to learn about other people's interests and in books and all it would cost me is the cataloging and the listing. And so that's, that's pretty much what I did. And then um, come after 1975, there was a, a whole litany of uh, experiences in Europe and Japan, the Far East, and uh, all over America, um, visiting people, buying books, selling books. And uh, after a while, it becomes second nature. Yeah. You can just, you know, a book will come in and you'll say, okay, uh, I know who this is. I'll pick up the phone and try and sell it or an email. And I'm sure you have the same kind of situation. And that's basically, you know, what I do. I love to buy books, but I also like to sell them. Yeah, that's important. And uh, I don't know. I don't know how much longer I want to, you know, do all this craziness of having thousands of books. I think at some point I'd like to have a critical mass of about 250 books all of them worth $500 or more. Right. And, you know, then I won't have to sell as many books to make the amount of money I need to make. Exactly. Plus I'm doing consulting, plus I'm doing uh, appraisals. So it, it all ties in together. That's nice. And I also do recommendations. People, I'll go to somebody's house and they'll have like 
you know, 100, 200 books, and most of it is nothing I want. Mm -hmm. So I'll call up a dealer who I know, the dealer comes, buys the thing, and in the mail I get a check for my commission. Mm -hmm. I said, Ooh, this is nice. <laughs> I was trying to do him a favor, and he's paying me. Very okay. nice. So I keep on working with the same guy because he keeps on paying me when I get lots for him. Time and dedication, keeping at it, has kept you at it, it sounds I, like. Yeah. At what point in that timeline did you say, hey, there's this organization called the ABAA. Hey, there's these book fairs that people do, and they sell their books. When, when did that come into well, the picture? We have to remember that around? book fairs didn't start until yeah. after I was in the trade. Yeah. Okay. So the thing about um, the ABAA was, we, J.S. Cannon and Company was a member of the ABAA. Okay. And uh, while I was working for that company, um, they uh, elected me to the Board of Governors. Okay. So I served for three years on the Board of Governors, and I began to learn all the things that are important and all the things that are just a lot of bull. Right. Uh, we've had some great presidents and some great boards, and the ABAA does a hell of a good job um, promoting book selling and having these uh, ABAA fairs. When we first started in the 50s, they were, the fairs were like very small regional things. Uh, in Cambridge, for example, they, they rented a, a, a hall at a school and there were like 25 exhibitors right. and there were more you know, people coming in and buying. And that was my first experience with a, a book fair. And then we started to think in terms, well, what can we do here? So we formed a book fair committee of myself, Ken Gloss, mm -hmm. uh, Harold Burstein, who is dead, and another guy whose name escapes me after all these years. Uh, he, was a, he was a fancy dresser, and he liked to speak like he was an Englishman, but he you know, comes from Roxbury or Dorchester or something <laughs> like that. But, um, so the four of us formed a, a book fair committee, and we went to uh, the governor's office, who. Uh, it was Dukakis was the governor at that time, and he proclaimed the opening night of our book fair as a book week in Boston. Wow. So that's, we got that going for us. And our first book fair in Boston, I think we had like about 40 or 50 dealers, and now there's over 130. Mm -hmm. So it, it's gone from one thing to another. I think the most important thing about book fairs is one, always try to have it in the same location. Yeah. People get used to the same location. They do. They don't want to wander around looking for some place they've never been before. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing about book fairs is you have to spend time uh, pressing the flesh. Mm -hmm. You have to spend time talking to people, mm -hmm. um, getting to know what they're interested in or what they're not interested in. How do they size up? Are they a, are they a thousand dollar book buyer or are they a fifty dollar book buyer? Mm -hmm. And these are things that you learn over time. And the collegiality of being in this association is beyond belief. Uh, there's so much sharing and there's so much caring about one another. Uh, the, the fact that we are in business and we often, you know, bump heads on mm -hmm. things hasn't kept the collegiality away. Uh, you just, peop we just share with each other, we help each other, and it's a wonderful organization. One of the best things the ABAA does is the Benevolent Fund yeah. and the Elizabeth Woodburn Fund. These allow people who don't have the wherewithal to try to become something they want to become. Mm -hmm. And it's worked a lot. Mm -hmm. We've saved a lot of people's lives and businesses with the uh, Benevolent Fund. And uh, it's just been, it's heartbreaking sometimes when you, when you get a letter from somebody and said, my, my entire building was burnt and all my books were with it. How am I gonna? How am I gonna survive? And so, we help them. Yeah. We give them grants that are payable back or not payable back, mm -hmm. depending upon what goes on. And these grants have helped a lot of booksellers uh, go from down here mm -hmm. gradually up the ladder. Yeah. So I, I think that's one of the best things that the ABAA does. Uh, but back in the fifth, late fifties, the there were some book fairs going on but they were kind of like funny ones. The New York Book Fair was every other year. Okay. And in between the two years, there was a cooperative catalog. Then anybody who wanted to put stuff in, um, it would be a cooperative catalog, and we each gave each other 20%. Okay. So if I sold your book, yeah. you'd send it to me, and I would send you a check back for 80% of yeah. 
what it is. And so that was okay, but that, it was difficult because you have all these people want to go to a book fair. A lot of them don't want to expose their stock in, in the sense of uh, a catalog. Mm -hmm. So that started to work out well. And then we started to get into the armory. And once the New York got into the armory, people in New York began to think in terms of, well, April, the armory mm -hmm. for books. Now it's March, the armory for right. books. But, but they uh, still know to go to the armory. They still know to go to the armory. Uh, and it's and built up quite a it, panache. It, but we had something over at, the, uh, at some big uh, center towards 8th Avenue. Uh, it was an international. We had uh, some kind of international meeting over there. And it seemed like the, the crowds were not crowds. Mm. There were a couple of people would come in, a couple of people. It was not something that they were used to doing. Yeah. And it felt different. Now there's like three book fairs going on in New York City at the same time, and nobody feels uncomfortable about it. Amazing. And, and those, those aisles are busy. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it, it's healthy. Yeah. And it's booming. These aisles are busy. Yeah. And it's healthy. And yeah. it's booming. Wow. The business has uh, changed. Uh, you know. What would you say some of the biggest ways it's changed has been? Well, a lot of things have happened. One thing that has happened is the reprint craze that was in the uh, 80s and 90s mm -hmm. where there were people who were reprinting anything that was out of copyright. Yeah. And uh, they were doing different, you know, 500 copies of this, 300 copies of that. And what they were doing essentially is they were destroying the original edition because as a librarian or as a scholar, you could buy the reprint. Mm -hmm. The, the original edition he needed to be sold to a, uh, a library that would appreciate what it is, or a collector who was advanced enough to know what they, what they were buying. Not just looking for the data. Yeah, not, not looking for the data, looking for the beauty of the book, the printing, the binding, what was inside. And it's just a, it's a romance in a sense. Every time I, I walk into a bookshop and I see something, that uh, I really like, I get excited, and I carefully open up and see what the price is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can buy it, and sometimes you have to walk away. Mm -hmm. And that's, know. That, know. it's very important because a lot of people don't know how to walk away, that they're willing to pay four or $500 for a book they're only gonna sell for six or 700. Mm -hmm. But if they sell it right away, it's okay, uh, you, you get the turnover. But if it sits on your shelves for five or six years, mm -hmm. that money's been tied up. And that is such smart business sense, so wise. It came to you early, it seems like. Yeah. But it doesn't for everyone. And um, there's a little thing called the Colorado Antiquarian Book Seminar. Right. That helps people figure that out, figure out their voice, figure out the nuts and bolts that w romance that you talked about. Yep. Sometimes we get it as a collector, sometimes as a dealer that romance is there. We just know we want to be a part of the trade. Yep. And you know a little something about cabs. Well, yeah, we started it. Uh, I didn't start it. I came into it about six, five or six years after it had begun. And it was called, uh, at that time, it was called the Denver uh, Antiquarian uh, Book Seminar because it was being held in Denver at uh, University of Denver. And uh, I didn't know quite what to expect. And people would, first group of people we had, we had like 90 people mm. in the first class. And we had four people on the faculty. So we figured out that between the four of us, we'd have to cudgel at least 20 people. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, take them off the shelf. Yes. And sometimes people come to that, to the cabs, and they, they're nervous, mm -hmm. and, and they, they don't know, do I fit in with this group? I mean, do I understand what they're talking about? I mean, and you have to sort of comfort some of them. Mm -hmm. I remember one person came to the, to the uh, early shows in Denver. She was all excited about it, and when she, after the first day, she came to me and she said, this is not what I thought it was gonna be. Mm -hmm. And she went home. Wow. <laughs> Better that than 20 years beating your head against a business that you don't really want to try. That's to, right. You know. I don't. I don't know why she came in the first place because it is a book seminar. I don't know what the heck she was thinking about. She wanted to be an author. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe she wanted to be a forger. I don't know. There's a lot of forgeries in in the, in the business, mm -hmm. but 
I just, uh, I just really feel like most people Burton, outside the David business. David Burton, you have a guest looking for you at the main entrance. David Burton. It, it, it's, it's an impossible business to try to, to describe to anybody, but uh, one of the things I always got a kick out of, I would, you know, at a cocktail party or at a dinner party, and you know, people say, well, you know, what do you do? I said, well, I buy, sell, and appraise rare books and manuscripts. What? Rare books, manuscripts? What, what's that about? And so I would try to explain mm -hmm. some of the things. I would use examples like The Wizard of Oz, and Dr. Seuss, and you know, the things that they may understand. Right. And if I try to hit them with a bibliographical citation, they probably would have run the other way. But it's a good opener at cocktail parties. It is. Yeah, it, it, it is. Well, what happens is that after I'm talking to one person, another person wandered over it. And then another person. I felt like I was holding court. <laughs> you are. In a sense, yeah, but it was great fun. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. It's pretty much an honor to be a part of that, this kind of mysterious world. Because everybody knows a book that has changed their life, maybe, or has stayed you know, in the, the, this mystical space. When they look back on it, something nostalgic or something that nostalgic. maybe they found in college or something that was their parents, something that they that is imbued with a lot of meaning, and so it is an emotional business. Yes, it is emotional. You know, it's 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 cultural, you know, legacies, but it's also at its base just, you know, we don't people don't need the book. They're not going to eat it. They can't live in it. They're not going to drive it. I tried to eat a book once. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't work out well. So, uh, well, back to cabs for a second. Yes. Um, about, I would say, oh, maybe six or seven years into my reign there, uh, Jake Chernofsky uh, was was running it because uh, he had the A, B, and stuff. And then he came to uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Larson, myself, Ed Glazer, and Bob Top from the Hermitage were sort of the mainstays. We did most of the interview, or most of the questions and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jake came to us and said, look, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, here's what I propose. Uh, for $5,000, you can take over the seminar. And you don't have to pay me right up, you can pay me you know, a little a little bit of, no. So we had a meeting okay. at the uh, LA Hilton, mm -hmm. uh, right where the book fair was, myself and the other three participants. and. We said, well, what are we going to do? I mean, Jake, if Jake doesn't want to do this anymore, it's going to die. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why don't somebody step up and be the director for a while? So Ed said, I can't because I've got this, that, and the other thing. Jennifer said, I I'm not interested. And uh, Bob Top said, I've got a bookshop that I have to run. I, I don't mind being here for a week, but mm -hmm. I can't spend all the time. So everybody looked at me. Oh boy. Okay, I guess uh -huh. I guess I'm the odd man out. <laughs> so yeah, I said okay, I'll take it over, I'll do it, and at some point, hopefully, I'll be relieved of my duties. Mm -hmm. So I started doing it, and I, I what started. Year was that? What year was that? Kinda sorta. Of? Oh, uh, maybe in the '80s. Okay. In the early '80s, and uh, so I had to find out. We had to have a guest. Uh, 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 sort of like a keynote speaker, and we had to have a. Um, Can I have your attention, please? A, Bob Harris from a, the a person who had a specific please category, like an Americana, a literature, American. children's yeah. books, and that kind of stuff. So that's what we did. I, uh, one time, I had Rob Ruma Miller mm -hmm. as our Americana person, and um, he absolutely flipped out when he saw what was going on. He said, I can't believe that this was going to die. I said, I can't believe it. This is so fabulous. It's wonderful. We're going to bring hundreds of booksellers into the, into, the, uh, into the association. And so after about five years of struggle, and I mean struggle, when uh, we, we used to give out stipends to the various members of the faculty, and you know, we'd pay for the, um, the guest speaker from wherever he was and put him up for the night. And uh, we were having trouble. We had like four or five years where we barely had enough people to break even. And then something happened, and I don't quite know just when it was, but something happened and we went from, from 40 or 50 up to 60 and 70. 
and then we went to 80, and everybody said, this is too much. We can't handle this many people. So Rob, I said to Rob, Rob, do you have any interest in keeping this thing going with us? He said, yes, I love it. I, I want to do this. I want to be helpful. I want to. So Rob would come with his books so people would have a good books to look at instead, instead of, you know, average little things. Mm -hmm. And he would give the descriptions and we had all this stuff going on and he just loved it. And at one point I just said, look, I, I just, I, I've gone this far. I think it's time for some young people, some new blood, new ideas, and you're the guy. And he said, you mean it? You really mean it? I said, yes, Rob, you're a terrific guy, terrific bookseller, and you're going to make a terrific director. Oh my gosh. So he did. And he's still there, mm -hmm. but Lorne Bear's the new director. Mm -hmm. um, Lorne is a good guy, too. I mm -hmm. like Lorne. But that's, that's what happened. It, it was going like this, yeah. and then... It went okay, white like this, and now, its life. you know, it had a big dip, and we didn't know whether we were not going to survive. And then, and then it just kept getting Kinda a little like bit better. Trade. Yeah, you don't, you don't know. But we, we had some fabulous uh, young people come, and there was at least here, there's at least 10 booksellers here who took that course. At least. In the early days. The early and then days. over the days, we probably got put 30 or 40. 30 to 40 people in the ABAA yeah. who graduated from, from the cab school. And uh, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of sorry that they're moving out of Colorado. Yeah. They're moving up to Northfield, Minnesota, where I understand the, the, uh, they really want the cabs badly. They have a beautiful campus. Mm -hmm. They have a wonderful library. Mm -hmm. uh, the only problem is in Northfield, Minnesota, there's only two hotels. So I don't know, I don't know what's going on. That's where the book commune needs to be, which somebody needs to buy a property. <laughs> and the only thing in, in town to, to see is the bank where the James Brothers robbed, the Northfield <laughs> Bank, back in the Not 80s. Not that much in Colorado Springs either, I, I can tell well, you, right? I, Colorado Springs is a different thing altogether. <laughs> yeah. Altogether. But it was great, and, and I'm happy and proud to have participated in it. And I think that uh, if it keeps going, there are going to be a lot of young booksellers who will become major booksellers as the mm -hmm. years go on. It's already happening. It is happening. Yeah. Look at you. Thank you. 2011. 2011, <laughs> yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, I, only eight I, years I, ago. That was my cab's year. Yeah. And a lot of us from just that year are uh, I'm on members. the floor yep. or doing their thing all across the country. It's uh, I'd love to do a tally, actually, of how many current ABA members are CAPS graduates. It's a lot. I would think it's a lot, yeah. And I'm glad it's still, you know, whatever city it's in, fact it is, it's alive. I went to the opening uh, dinner and the closing dinner of its last year out there oh. this summer. So I, I, How was the I dinner? Where was the yeah. dinner? Where they it was it? in Hogwarts, which is what I call the dining hall there at C at the at the college. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did or, you go to, did you did you go did you go to Thursday night? No, um, I just drove down Sunday night open and Friday or Saturday night close. Yeah, it's kinda of say goodbye and you know it's got as much passion and life and excitement and tenaciousness and expertise and heart as it I think ever had. Yeah. So I, I think I think it's an important thing for not just for, for booksellers, but librarians. Absolutely. Collectors. Collectors. And they come to see how we think, how we operate, and um, what is our modus? How, are we doing this? Are we doing that? Are we doing? And it's an open, it's such an experience for them. They come to me after and say, I never knew you guys did work this hard. Mm -hmm. And I say, look, if you're not having any fun, you shouldn't be in the business. But overworking in the business, you love it. Yeah. There's just something about, you know, getting a box of books and in the mail, yeah. and then it's lunchtime, and I say, well, I really want to. It's 3:30 in the afternoon. I'm still opening up the books and doing doing work on yeah. them, and forgot about lunch completely. Exactly. So, but that that's just and me. I, it just keeps you. It keeps you. It keeps young. me young. Yeah, I was gonna say, it, yeah. but it does. It keeps you young. Hopefully, it keeps all of us young. Well, who knows? Uh, the The prognosis for the trade is very difficult. We're going through a period, I think, where people are more interested in the visual mm -hmm. aspects of books yeah. rather than the content of them. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a good thing or if it's a bad thing, 
but I have a lot of people come up to me and say, um, uh, do you have any children's books? And I say, no, but I'm curious, why is a banker interested in children's books? Mm -hmm. And he said, these were the books my mom read to me when I was little, and I vowed someday I was going to own them. And I'm not going to own a cheap copy. I'm going to get the best copy I can. And I find that a lot, a lot. People wanting to buy things that are reminiscent of their youth, of growing up, uh, of all the things that go along with growing up. Yeah. I just, you know, it's the, to me, this is the best way to express yourself, being that most booksellers are round pegs who don't fit into square holes. That's right. And so, you know, I wouldn't want to work in a drugstore. I wouldn't want to work at, I don't want to be a librarian. I don't want to work in, uh, you know, one of the new bookstores. Just the, the fact that I'm holding a book that was printed in 15 something mm -hmm. gives me chills. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It still does. <laughs> it gives yes. me chills. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, we're so thankful that you're still picking up those books and that you're still getting chills. I'm thankful I can still pick up those books. <laughs> and we're thankful you're still at the desk. Maybe you should eat lunch. But <laughs> no, I get, yeah. if, if the box comes in, I, Forget it. If I'm out at lunch, I'll be thinking the entire time, yep. what is in that box? Yeah. i got to open that box before I go to yeah. lunch. That's I can't it. wait to get back on the plane so I can go catalog. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I need to go home and catalog. <laughs> well, I, said to, I said to my daughter as we were driving in, I said, uh, Lee, uh, how about we just turn around and go home? <laughs> so that, she said, no, we have to do this. Well, but I, I enjoy it. I love it. I love the book people. I love collectors for the most part. And I just love the, the hunt. And we love you too. Austin. I love you too. Austin, thanks you. And the trade, thanks you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michael. You're welcome.